¿sí? sobre Sitak. Cada vez que hablamos de arte contemporáneo, eh, sobre todo aquellos que vivimos y trabajamos día a día en el mundo del arte, eh, solemos eh, culpar de todos nuestros malestares al, al mercado, al, al, al medio, a las galerías, a, al hecho de que el arte se vende y que, que hay un interés económico en el arte. ¿no? Eh, y a la vez eh, es, es, dependemos de él, eh, es, es vital para la continuidad de, de este sistema, eh, es, esta extraña conjunción que es el el sistema económico y el sistema la libertad de, de artística de manera que eh en esta mesa, eh, dentro del tema de la historia, vamos a analizar la manera en que el marketing, la mercadotecnia, eh, la promoción la, y la, el, el lenguaje, eh, tanto económico como verbal, de este, de este tipo de, 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 de lecturas de, del arte, eh, intervienen en la, en la fabricación de una historia eh, determinada. Eh, Creo que son, son temas constantes que, a los que siempre nos referimos, pero que no, no realmente tratamos eh, eh, detenidamente. Y eh, en este caso hablaremos de, de ciertos antecedentes, en bueno, el siglo XX, eh, hasta bueno, a otros temas relacionados que no, no están directamente relacionados al, al dinero, sino a la política, la intersección entre los eh, intereses políticos, económicos, eh, no, no lo que, lo que, en lo que deriva ¿no? el, el, el marketing, no necesariamente ligado por dinero, sino por intereses políticos, que es la propaganda. <coughs> eh, Conmigo están esta tarde Don Hades, eh, quien eh, hablará eh, sobre la, la obra de Salvador Dalí. Eh, Don es profesora de Historia y Teoría del Arte en la Universidad de Essex, eh, en Inglaterra, y es eh, director del Centro de Investigación para los Estudios del Surrealismo y sus legados del Consejo de Investigación de Artes y Humanidades, y codirector de la colección de arte latinoamericano de la Universidad de Essex. Entonces, estamos muy contentos de tener a Don con nosotros. Eh, también este, está con nosotros Massimiliano Gioni, eh, quien también dará una, una ponencia al uh, respecto de este tema. Eh, él eh, trabaja para la, es el director de la Fundación Nicola Trussardi de Milán, al mismo tiempo que ha colaborado con varias instituciones y eh, junto con Mauricio Catelán y Ali Subotnik, será curador de la Cuarta Bienal de Berlín en el 2006. Otros proyectos que él ha realizado incluyen Manifesta 5, eh, una, La Zona, que fue una, una exposición especial para la, la Bienal de Venecia, y eh, ha estado muy involucrado en, en un sinfín de publicaciones y exposiciones de arte contemporáneo. Eh, y finalmente, la que está con nosotros también es Tania Bruguera, quien eh, es, es eh, artista cubana que ha trabajado eh, desde 1986 con el cuerpo, un paisaje, un cuerpo como un paisaje político, como ella lo describe, eh, creo. Este, eh, ha participado en Documenta 11, la última documenta en Kassel, así como en diversas bienales como la de Venecia, Johannesburg, Sao Paulo, Shanghai, La Habana y Site Santa Fe. Su obra se expuso también en el New Museum of Contemporary Arts y el Museo de, de Arte Contemporáneo de Chicago, el Bowman's Van Buren Museum de Rotterdam, y así como muchos otros. Es un grupo realmente muy diverso de gente y espero que eh, al final de las, de las discusiones tengamos, como siempre, un, un debate a seguir. Comenzamos con Don Hades. Thank you very much. And I would like to thank CTAC and Pablo Helguera very much indeed for inviting me here. I apologize for not speaking in Spanish, and I will try to speak slowly enough to enable the translation to occur, because much of this is going to be improvised. I'm going to be talking about Salvador Dali, and I should immediately lay some cards on the table. Um, I have just spent the last three years organizing and finally overseeing a very large exhibition of Salvador Dali at the Palazzo Grassi in Venice. This was actually the only exhibition to mark Dali's centenary year, which was actually organized outside Spain. At least 11 other exhibitions of Dali's work were organized inside Spain. Clearly, I think, seeking to, as it were, lay claim to Dali as a Catalan or a Spanish treasure of the national culture. 
and my exhibition was by contrast an attempt to look again, not just at the famous and admired Dali of the Surrealist years, but at late Dali, which is actually a very peculiar and interesting problem. I had hoped also to be able to show you a small video that I made of the exhibition, but as I am technologically totally incompetent, and the person who was supposed to help me didn't have time to do it, I can only show you a very small, and as you will see, dangerously chosen snippet. <laughs> well, <laughs> the, the Dali case is a peculiarly interesting one. I can think of few, if any other, major 20th century artists whose popularity um, combines with such virulent dislike on the part of both critics and historians. The extreme disdain with which Dali has been regarded by critics, curators, and historians of modern art has in fact multiple sources which are ethical, political, and I think less aesthetic. But the strength of this opposition to Dali makes one wonder whether there really hasn't been something to hide on the part of the critics. One, one just wonders if it's every Dali was every critic's guilty secret an adolescent passion to be recanted and eradicated on reaching maturity. He's also a very easy target, and he was, in many respects, monstrous. He was spectacular and a great showman. But what I want to do is to suggest that there are important ways in which we should look behind the spectacle. And in order to make what I have to say link with the themes of this talk, I'd perhaps like to indicate now where I think what I have to say might be relevant. One is that I believe that this critical opprobrium, which has clouded Dali's reputation for the last 40 years, has actually obscured a number of ways in which Dali was actually the first to do something, the first to invent something, uh, the first really to explore the possibilities of things, I mean, such as photography within surrealism, the found object, the artist's video, and so on. Um, that I could expand on, but I think that is one consequence. I also think that the, um, the critical reevaluation of Dali the attempt to dismantle the critical prejudices that have so far dogged his reputation have actually shown up a real poverty in, within art history. There's no doubt that some of the most interesting work being done now on Dali, late Dali included, is actually by literary theorists, by cultural theorists, even by scientists. So I'm suggesting that there's something there we need to think about and to look at. But before I try and articulate my more positive view of, of Dali, and, and I should immediately say that I'm actually myself, I kind of got corralled into Dali, and I've always been a little ambiguous about it. Um, we can talk more about that later. But I want to trace briefly the, the stages by which Dali's bad reputation accumulated. But I'm going to begin, and this is actually quite brave because I'm just putting my head in the lion's mouth here, that is your mouth. I'm going to begin with um, a, a video that shows Dali at precisely the moment, oh, no, I wouldn't put it like, sorry, it shows Dali at his very worst from the perspective of the surrealists. Could, could we have the video?
<laughs> well, there, there you have Dali. Okay, so, whoops, stop. Yes. Um, there you have Dali, the Hollywood, um, the Hollywood darling. I'm sorry if you couldn't hear it, hear it properly with the English. Uh, it ended up by saying um, that, that you know, it's not a surreal dinner. These frog, the, them frogs is real. Um, Bob Hope. Okay. Well, firstly, Dali's rejection by the Surrealists in 1939. I'm, I'm, I'm now mapping um, very briefly uh, the stages uh, by which this this bad reputation has built up. Um, Dali had finally put himself completely beyond the pale by siding with the fascist victor in the Spanish Civil War. I think it's now clear that Dali would have done anything in order to return to his Catalan home at Port Ligat. But the contrasting example of Picasso, who refused to enter Spain during Franco's lifetime, was a permanent reminder of Dali's political fallibility. The Surrealist leader, André Breton, also deplored the cynical means by which Dali has imposed himself on the public and gave him the enduring anagrammatic nickname, Avida Dollars. The Surrealist's rejection had a long time effect on Dali's critical fortunes because he lost the support of the only anti-modernist grouping, that is the Surrealists, while simultaneously alienating all the modernists. There is virtually no serious critique of his work for the next 40 years, that is from 1940, when, more or less when he moved to the United States, up until 1980, which was the date of the Pompidou retrospective, which really began the critical reevaluation. Could I have the first slide, please? <clears throat> first slide? OK. Ah, oh, yes. Um, uh, this is, uh, sorry, this, this is just a postcard from England. Um, it doesn't look as if it has much relevance to Dali. It's a recent front page of the Guardian newspaper, a left-wing newspaper, which ran a questionnaire to all the important people in the art world, asking them who had been, or what had been, the most important work of art in the 20th century, the most influential. And the three prime contenders were reproduced on the front page of this national newspaper. Um, I don't need to tell you which one, because otherwise they wouldn't have run it like that. Uh, it was obviously Duchamp's Fountain. Unfortunately, the person who edited it didn't realize that they needed a photograph of the original, which was never exhibited, never sold, and, and, and quickly lost. Uh, what they have there is a replica, which of course is quite valuable. But the point, I think, is that now Duchamp, and the number of times we've mentioned him, I think is significant, is actually regarded by almost everyone as the figure who has most fully, I think, commanded the, the respect and the interest of, uh, of contemporary artists for the last 20 or 30 years. Dali, by contrast, is probably nowhere, but I would like as a kind of sub-theme of this talk to suggest that Dali and Duchamp actually had more in common than might appear, and that there is something of a Dada anarchist in Dali, just as there was in Duchamp. Um, could I have a second slide, please? Of course, Dali was fortunate in establishing himself as a kind of brand almost before he had begun to make his reputation as an artist with this extraordinary painting called The Persistence of Memory. Could I have the next slide, please? Uh, and this is the uh, later painting called The Disintegration of the Persistence of Memory from the 1950s. And one of the questions I want to ask, really, is whether this is a sort of banal copy of the persistence of memory, um, making some side gestures towards Dali's apparent interest in science, or whether it is um, a, a work that genuinely should command our interest. Could I have the next, please? 
the only exception from this critical void that really surrounds Dali from 1940 to 1980 was the curator James Thrall Sobey. And he wrote in the 1941 catalogue to Dali's one, in his single exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, 1941, he wrote what seems to me a very prescient critique. It's tacked onto the end of his article. And he says, there is a problem related solely to Dali's emergence as a public figure, which deserves some comment. Is he an isolated phenomenon projected into fame by an unusual technique, a weird imagination, and a flair for publicity? Or does he reflect, in exaggerated form, the psychology of his epoch? Is he pure eccentric or part prophet? Although parallels between a, an artist and his time are frequently of dubious validity when drawn by a contemporary, there are a few in Dali's case which at least carry the weight of plausible conjecture. To begin with, even the most determined Narcissus cannot isolate his own image, and the pool into which Dali has stared so fixedly carries reflections of his surroundings that no flurry of pebbles can dispel. And I have put up the Metamorphosis of Narcissus from 1937 uh, on the screen here, which was clearly in Sobey's mind as he wrote. His former, remember he's writing 1941, his former identification with surrealism, which to many once signified a childish retreat from reality, may now conceivably be reread as a passionate espousal of a counter reality to which all France, all civilized Europe, have been clinging for assurance. The double image no longer appears so personal a device. Could I have the next one, please? Uh, this is Impressions of Africa, and I'm now going to just show you in, in succession uh, a series of close-ups of the little cluster of double images in the top left-hand corner of this painting. Of course, I'm sure most of you are perfectly familiar with the double images, but it's not always easy to see these particular ones. And uh, could I have the next, please? Uh, you can see uh, Dali's head, uh, sorry, Gala's head growing out of uh, Dali's head, her eyes becoming the, the openings of a building behind her. And then as you read across to the left, could I have the next one, please? Um, you, you can see a figure in a cloak, and again, the next one. Uh, two uh, donkey's heads, one of which, well, both of which actually also contain the form of a priest holding his arms out in blessing. Um, this is easy to see when you're there, and it, it, it's obviously one of um, Dali's references to, um, to his own sort of iconoclastic uh, feelings with, with Bunuel at this point. But I, what I want to say is that the, the double image no longer appears so personal a device in a world where statesmen as well as painters have portrayed objectives with such cunning that they have become, without the slightest physical or anatomical change, the representation of another entirely different object, the second representation being equally devoid of any deformation or abnormality betraying arrangement. Sobey goes on. In view of the frightful havoc which machines have lately wrought on earth, one may properly inquire whether Dali's loathing of them has been merely egocentric and ex exhibitionistic. To narrow the question, one may ask which type of architecture more accurately diagnosed the hidden psychosis of the years just before the war, machine à habité with their flat white roofing and broad areas of glass, or the small, dark, womb-like houses which Dali proposed to build as retreats from a mechanical civilization and which, as air raid shelters, recently covered the landscape of England. So that, that was a rare exception uh, in those years to the, to, to the um, general uh, dislike and um, indifference. Seth, can I have the next slide, please? I'll leave this up for a moment. Um, secondly, in the English-speaking world, which was largely Dali's audience during this period, his 1942 autobiography, The Secret Life of Salvador Dali, was widely misunderstood, above all by George Orwell, who took its outrageous claims entirely at face value. Dali, he wrote, 
he is as antisocial as a flea. Lacking an insight, this is Orwell, lacking an insight into the psychoanalytical sources of Dali's approach, Orwell failed to recognize that Dali was constructing a persona and his own personal myth, perfectly consciously. Ian Gibson, Dali's biographer, has continued the Orwell line in his book, which I think is um, rather unfortunately called The Shameful Life of Salvador Dali. If your autobiographer can't do better for you, I don't know who can. Um, thirdly, and I'm going to speed up now, sorry. Um, after the war, Dali stepped up his attacks on modern art in such tracts as Dali on modern it's not a bit what it appears on the surface. Under a magnifying glass, he is using a series of tiny, tiny dots. I mean, all sorts of things are very peculiar and just need more research. Could I have the next slide? I'll, 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 I think I'll have to really skip to the last. Could I have the next slide, please? Um, well, this is the premonition of civil war, and uh, I think I just have to mention um, one very controversial critique of this by Robert Hughes last year for the centennial, <laughs> where he says, every inch of it, from the sinister greenish clouds and electric blue sky to the gnarled bone and putrescent flesh of the monster is exquisitely painted. This, not Picasso's Guernica, is modern art's strongest testimony, testimony on the Civil War and on art in general. Not even the failures of Dali's later work can blur that fact. A problematic statement in some ways, but there's no doubt that, that Hughes is changing his view about even the sort of later surrealist Dali. And I just want really to end by looking at a late Dali painting. I don't have time to go through uh, what I would have wished to show you. Um, could I have the next one? We'll, I'll just identify the, the slides as we go. Next, paint, next slide, please. This is, of course, the Genica, uh, which is suffering now, by contrast, the premonition of civil war. Next one. Um, uh, Dali's interest in photography, his interest in found objects. Uh, for example, this sheet of photographs by Brassai was clearly overseen, <coughs> planned, and indeed made by Dali. I mean, may I say the little objects were found and some were made by Dali. Next, please. Um, the collage on the right called Phenomenon Ecstasy. Um, could I have the next, please? Um, a photograph uh, which accompanied an article by Dali called The Non-Euclidean Psychology of the Photograph, around which virtually an entire conference was based in Lausanne recently, uh, which a number of scientists addressed Dali's attitude to the non-Euclidean space. Could I have the next, please? Um, of course, we now tend to see Dali, if you like, through the lens of Warhol. Um, one might say Dali after Warhol. This is, this is Dali, the old hippie, embracing Warhol. Um, but I, although I think there's, there's a lot of mileage in this, uh, this comparison between Warhol and Dali, I mean, they are similar and dissimilar. Uh, Warhol undoubtedly admired Dali. He admired him because, he said, he's so big. Could I have the next? Please. Next slide. Uh, I'm proud of this enormous painting called the Garde Perpignan of 1965 as uh, the sort of thing that Warhol might have had in mind. Next one, please. Uh, next. And I, I'm just going to end with, um, with this painting, which is called the Sistine Madonna or the Anti-Matter Ear. It was painted in 1958, and it was included by Duchamp in one of the last collective surrealist exhibitions called Surrealism in the Enchanter's Domain. It created a great scandal, which um, Dali's biographer, Ian Gibson, uh, ascribes to Dali bullying Duchamp to put this picture in the exhibition. In fact, the opposite was the case. Duchamp solicited the picture, and when the Surrealists complained, he said they can just piss off. If they want to organize exhibitions, they can do it themselves. But why did he put this painting in the show? Partly because of the, of the optical effects. It's a different painting, very close to, where you just see it as abstract, from three meters back, where you see 
Raphael's Sistine Madonna. And then from 12 meters back, where you see an enormous ear. In fact, it was the ear of the Pope. Good example, again, of something that you can't really see in reproduction. But I, I want to, I, I think there is also here a, a kind of ambiguity, an uncertainty on Dali's part about his own attitude to, to religion, if you like, um, to the sacred. Uh, I think that when he once said that it, it doesn't matter for the public to know whether I'm joking or whether I'm serious, just as it doesn't matter for myself to know whether I'm joking or whether I'm serious, is something that I think places Dali in a very interesting relation to contemporary art. I'll finish there. Sorry to have run over. Hi, everyone. Um, again, I want to thank Pablo, Elguera, and Sitag for inviting me here. Um, as a matter of fact, I find myself in a sort of uncomfortable position because I'm not an expert of market, and uh, I'm certainly not an art historian. So while thanking Pablo, I feel also the urge of asking him, why am I here, in a way? Um, I suspect the reason I'm here is because I work for a foundation that is financed by fashion, or maybe because I consulted for a collector, or maybe because, in general, Maybe I flirted a bit with the enemy, being money or the market. Um, also, you know, the invitation came with a series of uh, questions that were quite tough, and I would like to share them with you. Uh, the email with the invitation came and suggested we should discuss and answer the following question. What is the role played by marketing in the insertion of artist groups or movements in art history? Where and when does business intersect with art history, and how does one affect the other? What is the role played by collectors in the elaboration <coughs> of a given history, how do artists incorporate and question the business aspect of art into their practice? I must say that if I had an answer to all these questions, probably I wouldn't be here. I would be a millionaire. And <laughs> with my right hand, I would be writing art history. And with my left hand, I would be dealing in art. So I also thought that some of these questions were hiding um, a sort of timid position. You spoke about the influence. You know, We were supposed to discuss the influence that market can have on uh, art and art history. I suspect that actually the word influence is a weak term, a too weak a term in this context, uh, simply because art and economics have not just been flirting for a while, they've been really sleeping together for a few centuries. And um, uh, which means not really you know, taking away the power from artists or taking away uh, their independence, but it means especially recognizing that art is not a matter that is left to artists alone. Ar artworks are actually actual deposits of social experiences someone has written. They are artifacts and objects that they live and perform in culture and perform socially. I think uh, even in the discussions today, uh, the word society and the word culture uh, were a bit lacking. And the word culture and the word society sometimes, especially in our Western world, whatever that means, uh, often means money. Um, <laughs> again, the person that say that uh, artifacts and artworks are deposits of of social experience also said something quite brilliant. His name is Michael Baxandal, and I think uh, he's quite a, an important art historian that we should go back to um, and read quite often. He said that artworks are fossils of economic life. Uh, no matter what an artwork looks like, no matter how it is made, somehow it incorporates and it tells us something about our economic and our cultural life. Um, actually, taking inspiration from Baxandal, I decided not really to show much of contemporary art, uh, but really to start back from, can I have the, excuse me, oops, 
Yeah, to start back from the days of uh, the Renaissance, actually, uh, for two main reasons. First of all, because unfortunately nobody has written a social history of contemporary art, which would be quite a fascinating phenomenon. And uh, uh, in a social history of contemporary art, probably such a context, like even this discussion, should be included. Why uh, someone is willing to pay money to bring us here? What are we listening to? And uh, uh, what narratives are we building? What stories are we writing? And secondly, I wanted to go back to the Renaissance because, uh, you know, especially when we think of Renaissance art or historical art, uh, we like to think of it as an idealized territory in which, uh, you know, artists are making their own creations and money or other interests are not involved. Uh, so what you see here is um, a 1423 uh, painting by Gentile da Fabriano. <laughs> And the one you see here is a 1426 uh, painting by Masaccio. This is a classical, uh, I mean, if you study art school, it's probably a comparison you've been through many times. It's the same subject, and uh, they were painted three, day, uh, three years after each other in the same city in Florence. And, you know, the two examples are often taken to demonstrate the passage between Gothic and Renaissance art from uh, a sort of frivolity of... Uh, uh, the Middle Ages with gold leaf ground and uh, a sort of uh, affected gestures, and then the more classical, more realistic um, postures of Masaccio paintings. Uh, about this moment in history, in art history, a few, I would say, hundred books have been written to describe this passage. And usually the, the, the most common description is uh, the rise and the diffusion of humanistic culture in Florence, and uh, uh, which is certainly true. But this guy I mentioned before, this Baxandal guy who wrote an extraordinary book called um, Painting and Social Experience in 15th Century Italy, came and um, actually argued that this transition from gold leaf painting to more classical postures has actually many more practical reasons to uh, that influence the artist and influence the reception of the work. What he basically says, and I'm of course kind of banalizing, he says the transition from what you see on the uh, right to what you see on the left is because patrons and collectors didn't want any more gold in their own paintings. And why didn't they want it? They didn't want it anymore because they were where new rich people, they were showing off and using gold more and more often. And so the more uh, educated and uh, truly aristocrats, uh, they were a bit fed up with it. There was also a problem, a shortage of gold in uh, the same years in Florence. <laughs> there was, of course, a diffusion of um, uh, neo-Ciceronian uh, neo writings, which were um, read by the aristocracy, and they were, uh, let's say much more uh, simple or much more classic in their own uh, syntactic structure. And uh, also, and maybe we should go back to, oh, excuse me, to this image, uh, something quite um, strange happened. Dutch cloth starts circulating among uh, the nobles and the rich. So here you see the two patrons, and they're wearing uh, this typical uh, Florentine outfits, and they're wearing Dutch cloth. And Dutch cloth, for some reason, uh, was at its best when it was black. So um, dresses with gold in it kind of went out of fashion around those years. So what we see here is basically a transition, an historical transition uh, within art history that we have often justified and explained purely in stylistic terms, actually has found reasons and has found its causes in a very precise economic system in which uh, money and uh, politics and society really played a major role. Um, going back again to the role of the two patrons, it's quite interesting <coughs> to discuss why um, these people were spending money in art. Uh, there is a rare testimony by Giovanni Ruccellai, who was one of the patrons in um, Florence that commissioned works by Domenico Veneziano, by Filippo Lippi, by Verrocchio, by Laiolo, and in the letter he says why he's spending money on art, and um, I love his justification. He says, uh, because they give me the greatest pleasure and because they serve the glory of God, the honor of the city, and the commemoration of myself. 
so um, I think if you take away maybe the word God and you replace it with visibility or fame or education, you also have quite an accurate picture of the reasons why even a collector today would tell you he's buying work or commissioning work. Um, and there are also even more interesting reasons. <laughs> Giovanni Ruccellai was a, an incredibly wealthy person and uh, um, he, again, confessed that uh, spending money and spending money well gave him a greater pleasure than actually making money. And um, paintings also had another great advantage. They were relatively cheap. Uh, you know, um, now in some nations, art is tax deductible. Back then it wasn't, but he had uh, um, the, the clear advantage of being much cheaper than buying marble pavements for church or uh, buying bells. And uh, it was highly more visible than these objects. You have to keep in mind that um, commissioning art in this situation didn't mean buying something that you would put in your house. And in this sense, I think there are a few similarities also to what we go through today. Um, artworks were not for private contemplation, they were not for living rooms, and they were very much to be displaced and performed in the public life, and uh, especially in the church. So whenever you commissioned the work, it was out there pretty much like uh, when a foundation or a museum or a collector today uh, don't acquire works to put in their houses, but put them out there in the public to perform. <laughs> So I think, in a way, a strange similarity between our situation and 15th century situation it can be drawn, especially because um, you know now we live a sort of schizophrenic time. We like to think that artists are free because we live in a sort of post-romantic understanding of art, but more and more, actually, contemporary art is created on commission, uh, on commission by museums, by curators, by um, collectors, and um, some might say, in fact that this is um, this idea, this collusion between economics and uh, art is actually true only of situations such as this, uh, situations in which uh, artworks are made on commission. But actually our very idea of the romantic artist that you know sits in his studio and produces work on his own dates back to a very peculiar historical moment which is basically Holland in the 17th century. That's the moment in which the artist is both free and at the same time alienated. Uh, it's the moment in which the idea of the artist painting his own work and then putting it out there in the market is born. And uh, this peculiar situation again is born because of very specific economic pressures and reasons. Uh, you have to imagine that you know, the age of Vermeer, the age of these uh, paintings of interiors, this, um, of domestic scenes, it was an age in which there was a furious um, market for paintings. Um, this writer named John Evelyn visits Rotterdam in 1641 and he goes <laughs> to the Rotterdam Fair and he says that there were thousands of paintings for sales and says that some of the clients buying these paintings were spending during the fair up to 3,000 pounds worth of art. Uh, in Antwerp in 1560 there were more than 300 painters and there were only 177 bakeries and 78 butchers. So uh, what you see as the origin of our idea of the artist working on its own and providing canvases and products uh, is actually created and generated because of very specific situation, which is mostly the rising of a new class, which is the middle class and the bourgeois class, and the disappearance of um, a religious commission, because in Protestant uh, Holland, uh, images were a little more uncomfortable than they were in Italy. Um, again, you know, a usual criticism that can be addressed to this reflection is that things get very different when we come to more contemporary times or to when the idea of modernism is um, spreading. You know, we are used to think of modern artists as antagonistic, as against the market, against society. And again, I would suggest that things are a little more uh, complicated than this. So let's go back, for example, to the origins of our idea or our legend and myth of modernism, and that is um, impressionism. 
um, you know, here again, I feel I, I shouldn't be here, but someone else whose name is Thomas Crowe should be here discussing these paintings. He has written incredible um, books and articles about um, the position of Impressionism and the relationship of Impressionism to mass culture and eventually to economics. Uh, basically, what he says, it can be summarized in uh, a few lines. Uh, he says, the advanced artist after 1860, and we could say the Impressionist or the Post-Impressionist, succumbed to the ge general division of labor as a full-time leisure specialist, an aesthetic technician picturing the sensual expectation of other part-time consumers. So in the very moment uh, where we place the birth of modernism and the birth of the rebellious artist, what we see is actually an artist that is depicting and that is an accomplice of a newborn uh, class and a newborn uh, division of time and labor. Um, it's not, of course, a chance that, you know, uh, impressionists are painting theaters, they're painting circuses, and when they paint en plein air, which is the big legend of the impressionism, they're not actually going, you know, out in the forest in some wild country, but they're uh, painting images from uh, small gardens or the first sandy escapades. And um, in other words, from the very early days of impressionism, uh, the avant-garde not only represents but also mediates the language and the strategy of commercial entertainment and tourism. <laughs> this is, uh, of course. And the same can be, you know, I, I'm being a bit brutal and uh, kind of too fast probably, but the same can also be said of the historical avant-garde, of Dadaism, Surrealism, or even before Futurism, and their infatuation with uh, shot tactics and uh, um, with the life of objects, the mechanic life of objects. At the moment, the very moment they're attacking and criticizing um, the world that surrounds them, Dadaists and Surrealists and Futurists are actually using the same instrument and the same language of the industry. You know, I always found quite uh, striking that cubism and the date of the introduction of the conveyor belt in uh uh, by far, they're actually the same. In 1905, um, a new industrial model that it's based on uh, taking things apart and building them again uh, finally um, enters the world of economics, and uh, the principle of cubism is not uh, that far. And um, so the very moment they are attacking their surroundings, they're actually reflecting it and incorporating it in their own world. The case of surrealism is even more um, painful, I think, because the very same moment that they are, you know, giving a life, a magic life to objects. They're also preparing the terrain for advertising and propaganda. And the very idea of modern advertising actually dates back to the surrealists. Whether they liked it or not, they were somehow accomplices of evil. <laughs> and, it, oops, sorry. Well, I have to skip a bit. And, you know, we can even go, and here I, I'm sure you will kill me, but we can even go as far as looking at conceptual art as a very peculiar phenomenon of a strange complicity or similarity between economics and art. The idea of the disappearance of the art object in the 60s and 70s, in fact, in the end, prepared the terrain for an economy of products without body, uh, an economy of abstract fluctuations of information. Uh, in the end, conceptual art is the closest thing we have to software industry and to this idea of uh, very light um, physical products but with great penetration power. And uh, I always thought it's kind of ironic that you know today we define ourselves as the information age. And uh, uh, in the information age, the art world is basically made of circulation of uh, brands and names that have become a primary source of information and also of profit in itself. Uh, you know, all this boils down, I think, to simply recognizing that you know, even the most radical example of modernist creation cannot transcend the culture and the economic system in which they are born. Sometimes they relate to it on a very metaphorical level and mimicking the language and the structure of industrial and economic forces. Other times they depend directly on the economic system in order to survive. Either way, recognizing the proximity of the promiscuity between art, culture, and economics doesn't mean dismissing modernism or art. It doesn't mean we are saying that art 
that is corrupted or unable to generate social change. Again, um, these are a few lines from Thomas Crowe. He says, from the beginning, the success of modernism has neither been to affirm nor to refuse its concrete position in the social order, but to present that position in its contradiction, and so to act out the possibility of critical consciousness in general. So that's why in the end it's irrelevant that Jackson Pollock's painting could be used as backdrop for a fashion shoot because Peggy Guggenheim liked so, and it's also irrelevant that someone like uh, Andy Warhol was at one point ready to sign and to sell anything available. Uh, it doesn't matter if the artist flirts with money, if he succumbs to money, or even if he goes all the way prostituting himself or herself, because art uh, has the power to take it elsewhere and to somehow um, you know, renovate the context in which is created. This is a very crucial aspect. What I'm suggesting here is to look at art in a more um, social sense, but it doesn't mean that um, we should start you know, being suspicious of artists themselves. There is another person that unfortunately couldn't be here in my place because he's dead, and his name is Henri Fossillon, and he says something quite extraordinary among many things. He says, art and artists satisfy certain needs, but also to produce new needs. Art is both timely and out of time. Art invents a new world in the very moment <laughs> it reflects the world in which it is born. This sounds like romantic or idealistic, blah, 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 but uh, as usual, Fossillon went down and really proved this point. And he mentions Van Dyck as a demonstration of his ideas. He basically says when Van Dyck was making portraits of the aristocracy, the aristocracy you see in this picture didn't exist yet. Uh, all the set of values and codes and social behaviors were actually much more different. And the power of a portrait of Van Dyck, besides being an extraordinary painting, is also to have given shape to a very specific set of characters and a very set, very specific aristocracy that modeled itself after the paintings and not vice versa. And I guess that's all. Thank you. Primero que todo quería agradecer a Pablito, a, bueno a Pablo, a Patricia, a Lucía, bueno a toda la gente que ha estado, a Magda, a toda la gente que ha estado correteando para que esto funcione y a la gente que han venido porque es impresionante tener tanta gente aquí, la verdad. Eh, y bueno, a Citac en general por existir, ¿no? Eh, si sí, hay pocos espacios ya que nos quedan así. Yo tampoco sé por qué me invitaron a este panel. <risa> Porque, como ustedes saben, en Cuba no hay mercado de arte. Y tenemos un solo patrón. Que es la revolución. No piensen mal. Aunque en Cuba en realidad no existe un verdadero mercado del arte, desde hace algún tiempo, casi 10 años, se viene hablando de este tema como si fuese un hecho. 
aun cuando no hay un coleccionismo nacional y tampoco del institucional que es casi nulo si sí ha existido en los últimos años una relación con cierta interferencia e inconsistencia con los coleccionistas extranjeros mayormente norteamericanos que llegan a la isla no sé si ha sido el poder de la repetición o los paneles con los expertos o la continua conversación sobre el tema o el entusiasmo por el esporádico dinero que llega de la mano de estos coleccionistas ocasionales o el esfuerzo de los proyectos galerísticos estatales que poco a poco se fue imponiendo no el mercado del arte en Cuba, sino la ilusión de que existía un mercado del arte a la manera occidental. Teniendo la ilusión de haber a la vez sustituido el anterior mercado de valores ideológicos, de que todos habíamos sido parte. Con esta ilusión vino, un no, vino eh, para nuestro contexto un novedoso y conveniente sistema de censura capitalista y con él un extraño aburguesamiento de una vanguardia que hasta entonces había hablado de los temas más dolorosos para la revolución cubana. La censura ideológica se convirtió y se sustituyó por la autocensura. Cuba, convertida en un theme park turístico socialista, tiene una producción artística que en muchos casos ha cosificado cómodamente el tema de la ideología. ¿Qué hacer en un lugar donde el Estado ha aprendido a capitalizar la provocación, que era uno de los elementos primordiales de la vanguardia? Donde la estrategia política se convierte en estrategia publicitaria. Donde la ideología molesta y se convierte en un elemento de atracción turística. Donde el censor se trasviste en crítico de arte, censurando no ya el aspecto conflictivo o contestatario que pueda tener una obra, sino las estrategias estéticas utilizadas en una construcción simbólica. Donde el tema es tratado como un aspecto sospechosamente secundario. Cuba es un lugar donde todo es político y donde el Estado es quien mejor comprende el valor simbólico de los gestos. Mi obra es nacida en ese contexto y, por lo tanto, ha sido un gesto político que ha tratado diferentes acercamientos a los acontecimientos del poder, enfocándose en el impacto y la transformación que este puede causar en las personas. Hoy les enseñaré dos ejemplos con los cuales he transitado por el mercado de esos otros valores. Han habido también eh, dos maneras fundamentales en las cuales he trabajado mi, mi obra. ¿no? Una en la cual la pieza final es completada simbólicamente por la conducta del espectador y otra en la cual el proceso de construcción de la pieza es en realidad la pieza. Y lo que vemos no es más que un recordatorio de ese proceso de conocimiento. Eh, estas dos piezas de las cuales voy a hablar también eh, se han tratado con distintos tiempos históricos. Uno hablando desde el presente, que es la primera que voy a mostrar, y la segunda que voy a mostrar es hablando desde el pasado. ¿Podría tener la computadora? Eh, los organizadores de la Bienal de La Habana, que se inaugurarían en el año 2000, me invitaron a participar. El tema era sobre la comunicación y el título Uno Más Cerca del Otro. Después de presentar varios y diferentes proyectos que fueron todos rechazados por razones estéticas, presenté una propuesta donde trataba el lenguaje y las maneras en las cuales se comunica el poder, es decir, a través de los medios de comunicación masiva. No creo que entendieron la propuesta, entonces pues la hice. El día antes de la inauguración pasaron algunos de los organizadores a revisar la obra. Cuando ellos entraron, yo apagué la luz y les expliqué que así sería la pieza. Y ellos en tono ofendido me dijeron que conocían todos mis trucos, que ellos querían la luz encendida para verlo todo bien. <risa> Sin darse cuenta que la fuerza de la pieza estaba precisamente en, todo, en que todo estaba oscuro, que la pieza hablaba de lo que no se veía y que era una obra en la cual lo político se daba desde la experiencia sensorial. Les voy a explicar brevemente la pieza. Eh, uno entraba, eh, estas eran unas mazmorras que se utilizaban durante la época desde los españoles para los prisioneros de conciencia. Entonces entraba, había, todo estaba oscuro y uno pisaba un, un bueno, el piso era eh, bagazo, que es la caña de azúcar molida. Eh, y había un olor bastante desagradable porque era entre fétido y dulce, ¿no? Entonces uno cuando más o menos se iba acostumbrando, a perdía todos los sentidos, ¿no? el sentido de, del espacio, el sentido de, de estabilidad, el sentido visual. Entonces poco a poco uno empezaba a descubrir que había como un pequeño, ahí casi no se ve, había un pequeño, aquí ven, había un pequeño, eh, una pequeñita luz azul. Y entonces la gente generalmente corría para allá, ¿no? Porque era como la obra. Entonces, eh, entonces cuando uno llegaba ahí, veía un televisor muy pequeño que además estaba puesto en el techo, lo cual hacía que el espectador tenía que forzar su posición así. Es decir, que una posición bastante incómoda, la cual ver el poder. Y entonces se veía un video que era eh, una 
historia eh, sobre la vida de Fidel sin ninguna, eh, ninguna visión mala ni buena, donde el leitmotiv era este, Fidel abriéndose el su saco para enseñar que no tenía ninguna eh, prueba, de, o sea, no tenía ningún chaleco a prueba de bala, es decir, que él era una persona eh, vulnerable. Eh, entonces, bueno, era, eh, la idea también era eh, trabajar con los medios de comunicación como la manera en que habla el poder, ¿no? Desde el cual eh, dialoga el poder. Después la gente decía, bueno, eran cinco minutos de video, generalmente nadie aguantaba los cinco minutos porque era muy incómoda la posición, la gente viraba y veían esta luz eh, y bueno, caminaban a, hacia la entrada. Ya para este entonces la, la vista estaba acostumbrada, la gente tenía mucha más eh, visibilidad a lo que estaba pasando. Poco a poco, cuando uno iba caminando hacia el al final, yo dejaba que entrara más o menos cinco personas máximo, para que hubiera también una experiencia bastante personal y no fuera, eh, la gente pudiera sentir cierta eh, intimidad. Eh, cuando las personas se, se acercaban a la salida, se, se daban cuenta que ellos habían pasado por cuatro eh, seres humanos, que eran cuatro cubanos desnudos, eh, y no los habían visto. Entonces, un poco la pieza era hablando desde el presente, porque era la Bienal de La Habana, donde todo el mundo iba a un turismo turístico, a un turismo cultural, eh, a ver lo que estaba pasando, pero en realidad no veían nada, ¿no? Estaban realmente obviando lo más importante, que eran las personas que estaban ahí. Eh, si bien creo que un artista político debe empujar los límites simbólicos hasta el punto de una incomodidad que no le deje más opción al poder que la impotencia de eliminar, le hace censurar, también creo que la censura puede convertirse en un ruido para la comprensión de la obra, pues hay un desvío del mensaje hacia el escándalo. Entonces me propuse tratar de hacer una obra crítica que no fuera censurada. Eh, la obra que presenté anteriormente nada más tuvo un día. Eh, bueno, para los que para la próxima conferencia entonces cuando me invitaron a hacer una exposición personal en el Museo de Bellas Artes en La Habana esto fue una cosa muy interesante porque después que nosotros nos invitaron a mí y a Carlos nos invitaron a participar en la documenta como que se creó una cosa muy rara ¿no? como en documenta hay que invitarlos a la o sea, que tienen que dar una exposición personal en el museo entonces eh, yo dije que sí, por supuesto. Entonces decidí que esta vez la pieza sería el propio proceso de negociación para hacerla. El título del proyecto era Autobiografía, ya que la crítica oficial en Cuba al reescribir mi discurso siempre le da una dimensión personal casi íntima que vendría más de un análisis psicológico que social o político. El tema de la pieza surge también de una conversación con una amiga que me contaba cómo cuando ella quería irse del país le hicieron un mito de repudio donde le, le gritaban las consignas revolucionarias combinadas con ofensas personales. Autobiografía es una serie de obras que tienen como su principal material de trabajo las consignas usadas durante los años de la Revolución Cubana. Mientras que en otros países la música, la moda o los eventos personales marcan el paso del tiempo, en Cuba es Playa Girón, la campaña de alfabetización, la zafra de los 10 millones o Elian González. La manifestación más popular de estos eventos son las consignas que se crean a raíz de esos acontecimientos y se repiten una y otra vez hasta crear una especie de mantra obsesivo. Las consignas marcan el momento en el cual la política y la ideología se unen, cuando son transformadas de texto simple en voz populi. La repetición infinita de estas hace que el evento histórico se convierta en causa personal. Pero los eventos cambian y la política se transforma, y hasta se niega a sí misma según las necesidades del momento. Las consignas que ayer fueron el bastión de defensa contra el mundo, hoy son desechadas o rechazadas. Las consignas son el estado efímero de la política, su fuerza desechable. Y en Cuba, cada uno de nosotros tiene que las obras de estos últimos. Es el uso de los elementos de negociación como componente simbólico, el proceso, el aprendizaje como la finalidad. Mientras que en las manifestaciones o actos políticos, el objetivo es el resultado, el cambio. Después de haber sido pospuesta tres veces la exposición, por diferentes razones que nunca entendí, durante un periodo de dos años, un día vinieron a mi casa eh, la directora del museo, el director del Consejo de la Plástica y la curadora jefa del museo, que no era con quien yo estaba trabajando, más la curadora que me estaba eh, haciendo la exposición. Y eh, se sentaron conmigo porque ellos necesitaban que yo le diera la lista de todas las consignas que iba a usar para, para la exposición. 
Y esta fue la verdadera obra. La verdadera obra fue cuando los censores se sentaron a censurar, no mi obra de arte, sino sus propias consignas. Ellos empezaron a, a decirme que no se podían usar varias consignas. Y de hecho, yo dejé, por primera vez en la vida, dejé que me censuraran una obra, eh, o sea, yo siendo partícipe de eso, porque ese era mi punto, ¿no? Eh, y entonces me pareció fascinante que el mismo poder tuvo que censurar su propia historia, ¿no? Eh, y esa era para mí la pieza. Eh, yo también utilicé, eh, esta, esto que ven aquí es eh, un póster de una de las consignas más importantes de la revolución que se llama Convertir el revés en victoria. Y esa fue la estrategia artística que yo utilicé para hacer esta obra. Cuando la pieza era eh, un espacio en blanco, eh, una entraba, tenía una pared eh, enfrente blanca y cuando daba la vuelta entraba este, este espacio y eh, se veían... Se, se sentía unas consignas, se sentía un eh, se sentía una cantidad de consignas que las vamos a ver ahorita, las se las voy a poner ahorita. Se veían muchas consignas que era como una gran histeria, no era como una gran eh, eh, o sea, de comunión de, de, de todas las consignas. Yo trabajé con un historiador que me ayudó a, con los periódicos de, desde el 59 hasta acá. Eh, sacamos todas las consignas, fueron como 187 consignas. Eh, y entonces, bueno, la idea era que tú entrabas a este espacio vacío, dabas la vuelta y estaba, bueno, solamente estas bocinas soviéticas. Eh, esta persona, que era la, la veladora de la exposición, que lo único que hacía era dar la impresión de que estaba controlando algo, pero en realidad no controlaba nada. Y, bueno, eso siempre pasa allá. Y entonces... <risa> Entonces, eh, la parte más importante para mí de la obra era que aquel que tuviera el valor de, o, o el deseo ¿no? de encaramarse, por decir de alguna manera, de subirse a este um, tabloncillo para hablar en el micrófono que se le había dado, eh, sentía esas mismas consignas como una vibración que venía del piso. Porque yo puse abajo del piso unos subwoofer y entonces eh, la pieza era que tú sentías toda esa vibración de toda la gente gritando ¡Viva Cualera! Bueno, ahorita lo van a oír. Y entonces como que lo sentías así, pero en realidad cuando, cuando tú te parabas en el micrófono, el micrófono no estaba desconectado. Entonces era un poco hablando con el silencio. Por aquí debe haber algún cubano, se está riendo mucho. Entonces eh, la, el catálogo de la exposición en un periódico. Esto me da una historia atrás. En 1993 y 94 yo hice una obra que era un periódico llamado Memoria de la posguerra, que era un reflejo. Eh, fue el momento donde la gente empezó a creer que había como un mercado. Entonces a mí me parecía que se perdía todo el sentido cultural que había tenido el movimiento artístico en Cuba. Y traté con ese periódico de, de aunar gente y, y, y crear un espacio. Que de eso se trata mi obra. Mi obra todo es acerca de crear un espacio. Eh, y entonces ese se censuró también. Y entonces, eh, en el 2004, 2013, hacían 10 años de que había hecho el periódico. Y esto fue una cosa que no lo dije hasta que se terminó la exposición, porque no quería que los censores vieran eso, ¿no? Pero no se dieron cuenta. Entonces, lo que hice fue eh, hacer un periódico. Yo quería hacer un tercer número, pero era imposible, ¿no? El primero había sido con gente de dentro y fuera, el segundo había sido... Y todos habían sido bastante contradictorios, eh, complicados, ¿no? Y entonces aquí decidí que ya no había manera de hablar, que lo mejor que podía hacer era hacer un periódico que no tuviera título, que no tuviera fecha y que no tuviera noticias, que solamente tuviera los eslogans de la revolución. Y las fotos eran esas imágenes que ustedes vieron de los carteles. La estrategia de poder es apropiarse de capital. La estrategia de poder ahora en Cuba, bueno, en general, la estrategia de poder es apropiarse de capital simbólico y semántico a las piezas y redirigirlos hacia una feroz estetización de la experiencia, apropiándose de las lecturas y hasta cierto punto de la circulación de las obras. En Cuba ya no se trata de controlar la carga política, sino la carga semántica. Eh, esta obra, eh, para realizar esta obra, yo usé la estrategia, eh, yo usé la ideología para contrarrestar, para contrarrestar la propia ideología. Eh, usé el poco poder que yo tenía para contrarrestar eso, el poder de ellos. La política es efímera. Es por eso que mi trabajo integra esto como un elemento. Uh, como un elemento. 
eh, las revoluciones las revoluciones eh, se mantienen y, y dejan su marca a través de los monumentos para mí el performance es el monumento eh, que más se viene al socialismo pues es el monumento al momento histórico al momento único al momento especial en esta obra había forzado poder a verse a sí mismo a autocensurarse usando su propia estrategia de convertir el revés en victoria incorporando la censura a la obra ahora en estos momentos estoy trabajando en, en educación o sea de la manera que estoy trabajando la crítica eh, de lo que está pasando en Cuba es a través de educación creé, creé una especie de departamento satélite del Instituto de Arte de, de La Habana en el cual tengo mi propio programa y estoy eh, trabajando con las nuevas generaciones entre, entre otras cosas diciéndole que obra y carrera son dos cosas diferentes yo diría que en Cuba eh, como diría Marx ¿no? eh, la historia se da eh, como tragedia y después eh, como comedia yo diría que en Cuba la historia se da como tragedia y se repite como pachanga como gozadera bailable aquí viene el remix que hice con las chancletas vanguardistas el principio es el himno nacional de Cuba Gracias, Tania. Eh, voy a hablar en inglés para poder tener una discusión. Um, I guess I should apologize because uh, um, paraphrasing what uh, Warhol said that Alison Ginger has commented, I guess we have the, the right people for the wrong panel. <laughs> uh, um, what happens when you invite people to speak, sometimes you don't know where they're going to take their discussion. And... Um, However, I think there's a lot of interesting things that were said that uh, ha there's certain interesting connections. Um, one thing that um, I would like to address, or maybe going back to what Don uh, presented and, uh, and taking what Massimiliano mentioned, we all know that, uh, well, I think it's, it's good to, rem to remember or the way that you have illustrated it, the relationship between money and, and art or power and money and how the, we do go back For, for a very long time with that relationship. Um, but I guess my question will be uh, in the 20th century and, uh, and with the artists gaining certain self-consciousness on, on the, the comings and goings of the market, <clears throat> what, what, what changes in, uh, in the 20th century? And I'm, in, in specific case of Dali, um, what do you think um, Dali uh, changed about the system? Uh, what, how did he subvert the system through his persona to To create this, this identity, uh, what, what is what is the, the, the innovative aspect of of this um, new character named Salvador Dali that um, that, that was different from uh, other artists of his generation of previous generations? Yes. Okay. Um, can I can I just begin by saying one thing that 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 struck me as sort of relevant to to your talk and to what we were discussing in general. And that was something that Frank Auerbach, the 
painter who came from Germany to England and still very much working. What, uh, you need to be closer to the mic. You, sorry? You need to be closer oh, sorry. to the mic. Um, I just wanted to quote something that Frank Alba um, said to me once, which is that you only get art when you get excess in the economy. Um, and I think, you know, in, in a sense, that sums up a great deal. But as far as the specific case of Dali is concerned, um, I think he was in a peculiar position, and I'm, and I'm sorry I didn't address the market more specifically, because as you know, I was originally going to be in a different panel, so I was in a sense addressing a different, a different issue. Sorry? Uh, you need to be closer to the mic. Please speak closer to the mic. Is that better? Just bring Is that better? <laughs> Can you yes. bring closer? Couldn't you hear me before? Even closer. Even closer. Okay. I wonder if I was... <laughs> no, right, right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I, I think that, that Dali, um, he, he didn't exactly operate outside the, the market, but he, 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 he lost his sort of classic avant-garde following. He lost the galleries that were good at selling contemporary painting when he left the Surrealists. And he was, uh, Julian Levy, I mean, that's not quite true, because Julian Levy, of course, did take him on in the States up until the sort of early to mid-40s. But after that, he was showing in a, in a variety of different galleries, which were not tremendously highly regarded. He, I think he developed um, a group of very dedicated patrons who would pay for more or less anything he did. And this, of course, meant that he was one of those artists, and we know many today, whose work goes straight into a private collection and doesn't, uh, on the whole, circulate a great deal within the market. Is that the sort of question? Right. Yes. Um, so uh, he had one major collector in the States, the Reynolds Morse couple, who bought really a, a huge majority of his work. One or two others, like Chester Dale, bought his paintings. He tried very hard to get into museums um, and did succeed in, in having um, certain donors buy works to, to, to give to the, to the Met. Um, I mean, there's, there's no doubt that he was, uh, you know, he, he was fond of money, or Gala was fond of money. Gala was his manager, and I think organized uh, basically all the arrangements that he needed. Um, but I, I would like to just quote something that I, I, I had to leave out um, earlier on, and that is a, a, a view of Dali and commodity culture from a different perspective from that in which we have been looking at Warhol and Dali. And that's from Raoul Van Eigen, um, and from his really brilliant uh, book called The Cavalier History of Surrealism. And he said that, that and he, he, he slams Dali, of course, as he does most, you know, much surrealism. Dali at least had the merit in his shameless pursuit of money, contracts, and honors of openly treating artworks as commodities, something which the Ernsts, the Miros, the Picassos, and all the other surrealist artists, whether they were talented or not, did only shamefacedly. Um, and I, I think that although uh, one can possibly make too much of that and build it up too much, I think that there, there certainly is a side to Dali which was perfectly happy to be identified as a mercenary, um, money-loving, manipulating market player. It's interesting that, in fact, he, he's not, by comparison with, say, Picasso, he, he is, is not an enormously expensive artist today. Perhaps it's not surprising, um, but uh, that that is uh, that is the, the case. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, Tanya, um, the um, well, I'm, I'm just curious about the. Um, well, these these uh, these processes that you go through in uh, subverting the existing systems that are that are placed on you, and um, 
Um, I, I just I just wonder how what is those the process you follow in order to to create your work uh, when you are in Cuba as opposed to when you are outside of Cuba and and the kind of challenges that you face while you produce a the work there and you show it there as opposed to actually um, because you are you are an artist who actually goes back and forth between two completely different systems you know you have you have a, you know an American uh, gallery and and you actually uh, do have to sell your work and sometimes you go to Cuba and then you you work um, or you have to subsist as an artist. Mm -hmm. So, how do you actually negotiate those two um, two different like, worlds in, in your work? Hmm. Uh, I think it's like going backwards and forward in time for me. No, sorry. Ah, perdón, perdón. Ay, disculpa. Eh, I'm sorry. Disculpa. Eh, no, creo que es como hacer un viaje. Es un poco como hacer un viaje entre presente y pasado, ¿no? Eh, en todos los sentidos, no solamente la cosa tecnológica, sino las maneras de ver el mundo y, la, y un poco. Eh, Sí, la manera de, de ver el mundo. Um, en Cuba, a mí me es más difícil negociar. De hecho, todavía estoy tratando de entender cómo funciona el sistema de fuera de Cuba. Porque de Cuba es muy natural, ¿no? Y es como... Um, no sé cómo, eh, como entiendo muy bien, entiendo muy bien cómo funcionan las cosas y, y por ejemplo, hay un elemento muy importante que es el aspecto personal. En Cuba todo es muy personal. ¿Sabe? El curador de la exposición te invita porque tú eres su socio y le gusta tu trabajo, pero tú eres buena gente y eres su socio y eso aquí nunca pasaría, ¿no? Entonces, <risa> bueno, aparte de que tienes exposiciones y eso, ¿no? Pero bueno, también eso funciona. Entonces, por ejemplo, eh, la complicidad que se dio entre la curadora y yo fue muy interesante porque ella quería hacerme una exposición desde que se, antes que se abriera el museo ella quería inaugurar el museo conmigo y se pospuso porque iban con otro artista después se pospuso porque, o sea, y entonces como que no sé en Cuba conocemos mucho el rejuego y, y lo importante es que se puede hablar de todo menos de eso ¿no? Bueno, casi tienes que, tienes que inventar una, una lectura múltiple de tu obra y una, sí. una lectura específica que no, no es acaso también una manera de reinventar, reinventarte es muy, es entre muy, la... Es muy raro sí. porque yo veo mi obra súper esquemática veo mi obra súper así esto es esto y significa tal cosa pero la gente ahí como que se han dedicado a releerla y a ponerlo en un contexto que no tiene nada que ver con lo social y con lo político ¿no? es como la nueva onda que hay ahí ¿no? de tratar de, de todo es intimista, todo es... ¿No? y entonces como que es el nuevo recurso entonces un poco yo, yo conociendo eso pues voy a ir a, yo, mi sistema es de guerrilla yo me llamo Tania porque Tania era guerrillera entonces creo que me ha influido en algo ¿no? y yo, yo sí trabajo con ese sistema de guerrilla en general no solamente las obras que hago en Cuba pero otras obras que hago ya sea porque hago performance o, o porque hago exposiciones que también no sé, creo que no respondí nada ¿verdad? Hay, una, hay una pregunta aquí atrás es directamente a Tania. Ay, Dios. Tania, buenas tardes. Soy un profesor y soy un escultor. Tengo relación con varios escultores de madera y de cubanos uh -huh. excelentes. Pero mi pregunta es algo que dijiste de la pedagogía y de lo que quieres hacer independiente de la cultura enseñando. A mí me interesa mucho eso. ¿Cómo lo quieres lograr, por favor? Bueno, ya hace dos años que empecé el, el, este proyecto y como decía antes, en Cuba todos los gestos son políticos y, y mi obra es interesante porque cuando la gente, cuando empezaron personas fuera de Cuba a ver mi trabajo, dijeron, ah, Ah, tú te influyó fulano y me engano. Y no, no sé quiénes son esa gente, ¿no? Yo no sabía quién era Marina, que debe andar por ahí. No sabía quién era Vito Concho, no sabía quién era nada de eso. Para mí, nada más existía la realidad cubana y toda la contradicción que se puede dar semántica de lo que es una acción y lo que es de verdad que tú piensas, ¿no? Eh, que me parece una cosa riquísima para trabajar y para hacer arte, ¿no? Eh, y entonces, uno de mis proyectos, eh, yo encuentro que hay un aburguesamiento, como decía ahí, de lo que fue la vanguardia. Es decir, ahora te vas a la fiesta y la gente habla de la casa más grande, del carro más... Uy, una cosa que en Cuba es insólita, ¿no? 
Y para mí es ofensiva porque el artista tiene, quizás soy una gente antigua, ¿no? Pero el artista me parece que debe tener, lo bueno que tenía el artista en el socialismo es que tenía un rol. Eh, hablaba por los demás o hablaba cosas que otra gente no tenía acceso a hablar porque tenía un privilegio, ¿no? Y lo usaba hablando. Eh, y eso se ha perdido mucho. Eh, y entonces, un, mi manera de reaccionar ante eso fue decir, bueno, esta gente está perdido, vamos a ir con la gente nueva, ¿no? Y entonces, eh, en la escuela de allí donde yo trabajé un tiempo, yo trabajé cinco años en la escuela del, del Instituto de Arte de, de La Habana, y me fui un día porque el director me estaba vigilando las clases y ya me berría y me fui, ¿no? Y entonces, ahora me pidieron hace dos años que si quería regresar. La, la documenta me vino muy bien porque todo de pronto como que se me abrieron todas las puertas, ¿no? En Cuba, afuera no, pero en Cuba sí. Entonces, eh, me dijeron si quería volver a dar clase, le dije que sí, con la condición de yo tener mi propio apartamento, ¿no? Y me dijeron, no, está bien. Ah, bueno, está bien. Y entonces creé este programa que, de hecho, ten, eh, para mí es como si fuera una pieza, porque yo estoy teniendo eh, un sistema de educación que es totalmente diferente, que se da en la escuela, y, y bueno, de eso quizás se pueda hablar más adelante, ¿no? Eh, yo estoy, por ejemplo, evitando el unidireccionalismo de la educación, eh, haciendo todas las semanas talleres de, con personas diferentes que se pueden contradecir. Tengo matemáticos que dan, vienen a dar clase a los alumnos de arte, eh, tengo psicólogos, tengo arquitectos, tengo todas esas distintas ramas. Y además de eso, un aspecto importante de la cultura cubana, del arte en Cuba, es que había mistificado mucho la producción fuera de Cuba, porque era por revistas nada más y no tenía el contexto para entender de dónde venía. Y entonces estoy invitando a muchos artistas, de hecho, algunos mexicanos van a ir pronto, eh, para que ellos tengan el acceso directo al artista y puedan eh, tener el contexto, ¿no? Yo voy. Ah, bueno. <risas> Pero quiero que compartas conmigo una experiencia. Lo tengo que decir abiertamente, en Puerto Ángel, Oaxaca, estoy haciendo una, entre paréntesis, una sociedad eh, civil para los artesanos y artistas que van a, a Puerto Ángel. No quiero decir más porque ya suben la publicidad, porque Vamos estamos negando la publicidad. Gracias. Quiero compartir tus Gracias. experiencias. Gracias. Eh, ¿Alguna otra pregunta? Aquí, preguntas aquí. Bueno, bueno, bueno. Bueno, sí. bueno eh, una pregunta para la camarada cubana sería que pues hay cambios muy brutales, ¿no? Digamos, el arte contemporáneo es muy difícil de asimilarse. Aquí mismo los artistas y el mercado. Pues si no hemos vendido la pintura gráfica y pictórica y escultórica, pues mucho menos un performance, ¿no? Y dentro de la incoherencia, si dentro de la educación en México ya se empieza a sacar a don Miguel Hidalgo de los libros y los nazis empiezan a ignorar, ¿verdad?, eh, la historia de este pasado en su autocensura, y Hiroshima y Nagasaki cada vez se nos hace más lejos en los museos de estos lugares para, para ver si esa bomba fue un experimento o qué fue y luego un presidente de este tamaño que está haciendo pues performance mucho, muy dobles pues es decir, ¿qué vamos a hacer los artistas con un aspecto crítico? es decir, estamos bajo la sensación de que estamos trabajando en lo invisible la pregunta sería la educación en este aspecto de nuestra modernidad y digo nuestra modernidad porque todos hacemos performance y todos hacemos cosas contemporáneas para llamar la atención y el escándalo que es la punta de lanza de todos nosotros pero pues no pega y no puede pegar como pero quisiera bueno, ¿no? bueno, a ver la pregunta sería ¿cómo vamos a programarnos para que pegue? ¿no? yo pienso yo pienso que yo estoy consciente de que yo soy una persona que viene de Cuba por lo tanto el acceso que tengo al real poder del mundo del arte tiene su límite eh, yo creo que los artistas eh, 
como, bueno, como yo o gente que viene de otros lugares así, eh, cuando presentan su obra en lo que viene a ser el gran centro de arte, si es que lo hay, um, un poco se le quita, se le quita la obra el contexto, se le quita la obra el contenido eh, local que pueda tener. Y yo creo que, por lo menos la estrategia que estoy usando es que cuando hablo a otros lugares que no es Cuba, eh, hablo desde tratar de cambiar la forma del medio en el que estoy trabajando porque creo que es un lenguaje que entienden la gente que están o sea es un lenguaje común al mundo del arte se supone que tú haces una obra en la cual tienes sí, un tema bla 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 pero al final tienes que transgredir algún tipo de, de construcción simbólica y proponer algo nuevo entonces un poco eh, por ejemplo hace poco en NYU hicieron una hicieron un panel donde yo proponía precisamente que el performance debía venderse y, te, y además hice toda la explicación de cómo se podía hacer y les di toda la estrategia de cómo hacerlo ¿no? Eh, y yo creo que entonces la crítica muchas veces cuando uno se pasa de ser un artista local a un artista internacional es que pasa de ser una crítica social quizás a una crítica de estilo por decirlo de alguna manera y entonces bueno es como una negociación que uno tiene que tener con su propia obra y que hay que ver cómo se resuelve eh, una pregunta más aquí ¿puedo entrar el micrófono por acá? Y disfotonales. I, I found your um, allusion to the complicity between Duchamp and, and Dali very, very illuminating. I was just wondering to which extent you could discuss the, the function of the stereotype that Dali uh, produced, because I sort of felt that there would be a need of, of um, discussing to which extent Duchamp was all the time kind of challenging the possible stereotypes about an artist. And Dali, on the contrary, found the space so as to keep on confirming a certain kind of um, French role, uh, an over, uh, in a certain way, he, he created a, a hyper stereotype. And I don't know if that kind of space is the one that you were alluding when you were describing that relationship with the contemporary art, which I mean, I basically missed exactly how to make that transition to the to the contemporary artists that that you were sort of trying to build up at the end. Yes, um, I'm not really room for that. Um, I mean, just one point, <laughs> alluding to your to the, to the first um, uh, quite correct, uh, I think, um, basically uh, point that that Duchamp was. Challenging, but I mean, Duchamp had basically been forgotten, um, except in certain sort of small pataphysical and Dadaist circles by the late 20s, or let's say early 30s. Um, And so I think I think to see him as, as an operative figure all the way through the 20th century really is a mistake. But that I mean that, that's just by the way. That's not that's not your main point. Um, I think the I think you're absolutely right to say that that Dali, uh, in, in, I mean, in a sense, how, how I see it, which is perhaps excusing it slightly more than than you would, is a kind of you know a, a sort of furious activity to to fill a vacuum, to, to, to hide a lack. I mean, the, the, the problem that he sees with painting. Uh, I mean, he, I think in, in a sense he, he he's constantly trying himself to renew painting. Um, and he is, he, he does a, a lot of experimental work. He does a lot of experimental work in the, um, to have you introduce Dali. I think it's a great starting point. And just to end up having come from seeing the East Village show in, in New York, he would be not out of place at all. In fact, I think he fits right back in there, including that videotape, which would have been, which would be fabulous there. I think the whole idea of the persona, the exaggerated persona, uh, you use the word prophetic, and maybe there is that element that holds true, that, uh, you know, the dress-up artists, the Ethel Eichelbergers, there are lots of them in New York where I think Dali would be amongst a lot of friends and wouldn't feel like such a kind of um, you know, oddity the way you say that that's been that art historical question about him. Bueno, hay una pregunta. Where is the question? 
Hasta atrás. <risa> eh, yo tengo una pregunta para Maximiliano y quisiera saber eh, si tiene algunos, bueno, algún, o sea, algunas publicaciones o algo donde pueda encontrar más información de lo que estuvo exponiendo. No. No, actually, you, to be quite frank, it's, um, I never really sat down thinking systematically about these subjects until uh, I was asked to by Pablo. And, you know, I think that, um, you know, again, even in this discussion, we keep going back to, to talk about the role of the artist and so on. And I think in contemporary art, we are really living a very strange time because money is crucial. Money is talked about because, you know, many artists are discussed because of their high prices at auction. But there is no such a discussion about the cultural value of money or the, the, the economical pressure or what it means to exhibit in certain situations instead of others. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to take on the job of <laughs> writing something significant about it, but I think it, it should really be thought about and even more discussed. Like we, we have discussed at length, like the influence of the gallery as a cultural space, but there isn't, for example, any that I'm aware of significant um, piece of writing about the economical also impact of what it means to exhibit there or what it means to exhibit in Bayenos um, or, um, you know, and also, uh, you know, what it means freedom and transgression in a system that values freedoms and transgression and uh, that welcomes freedom and transgression, and also what it means market in uh, a sort of global art world. I think this is another issue <clears throat> when you were asking what it means today and in the 20th century. Um, I think even exhibitions which have explored like the, the global trends and so on, they, they should reflect a little more about their own complicity with the market. You know, we have gone through so many exhibitions in which exploring the margins was valued as a good thing to do. And we probably have forgotten that sometimes this exploration is very much um, fruitful for market speculation. You know, it's, uh, it's no wonder that Everyone wants a new biennial with 20 new young artists because they cost less and you can take them to the next art fair. And I think, you know, sometimes we take for granted that going to the periphery or finding the young ones, it's a good gesture, but I think sometimes it's more or less consciously driven by a very cynical uh, principle. I would love to see a biennial of very old guys that you know nobody cares about and they, they might be living in New York and nobody even remembers them. And I think they could be even more generous and transgressive than... Let's do it in Cuba. They already have Buena Vista, so... Tenemos que terminar acá. Mañana continuaremos las discusiones. Gracias por venir. Gracias.